It is Thursday the 26th of September. I'm your host Brian Kia and this is the Quantum Cast. Okay, so to begin today's Quantum Cast, we're going to be looking at Vela Technologies and then Imperial Brands PLC and to finish everything off, Independent Oil and Gas. There's a mixture of RNSs released from these guys, but they all base around results or trading statements. So let's get into the first one, Vela Technologies. For those who haven't heard of Vela Technologies, they are an investing company focused on early stage and pre-IPO long-term disruptive technology investments. A lot of their investments in the past have revolved around Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. The only issue is that they haven't actually materialized any real gain. If we look at what they do, they currently have 12 investments in the portfolio which have either utilized technology or have been developing technology for some kind of value realization. But the only issue is when I look at the accounts of Vela Technologies, I can see that they had cash balances of £23,000. This was as of the 31st of March. They did raise around £400,000, obviously through a discounted placing. And that has now put them in a position where they don't need to raise money. Probably for the next half year or so, we could have a quick look at their cash balances and their net profit is something that we should probably look at because that's the most important figure when looking at companies such as these. The loss before tax stood at £1.5 million. So with £400,000 cash, they can't actually last a half year. It's more so a quarter, maybe two-fifths if we're trying to push it. I, I wouldn't really be as so optimistic to put it there. Uh, with Vela Technologies, they have a high capital expenditure as they are a technology business. The only issue here is that they don't actually have any revenue coming in. If we look at the administrative expenses, they are at £234,000 plus £1.1 million. The £1.1 million is a depreciation of fair value movements on investments. So it basically means that their investments have lost money this year. Although in previous years, they may have made some money. In 2018, their investments lost around 550k. Not as much as this year, which is uh, not that great to say the least. The operating loss though, went from 34,000 last year in the corresponding period on the 31st of March, that is 2018, to a loss of 1.427 million pounds on the 31st of March, 2019. So we can see that Vela are actually losing more money and the business is going in the opposite direction, which is not a good sign for shareholders. It's apparent that Vela's shares actually ran through a time of extreme volatility back in January 2018. The shares had rallied from a low a couple of months before at around 0.26 pence per share to highs of 1.2 pence per share. The shares had quadrupled over the matter of probably a month. That is worrying to say the least. The shares had tumbled right after placing after placing after placing when investors had realized that all this blockchain hype hadn't really materialized in Vela's balance sheet. There aren't really any major issues that can be fixed with Vela in terms of, say, cost reduction. I mean, if I look at the 31st of March 2019 finance expenditure, the total finance expenditure stood at £127,000, with 91000 of that being bond interest and 36000 being loan note interest. The fact that they're using loan notes is worrying in the first place, but it shows that a company like Vela may struggle to actually secure financing. If we look at that finance expenditure with relation to the loss, that is a tenth of their loss and they don't have any revenue. So they're paying out money before they actually take anything in, in terms of debt repayments, which is crazy. The fees from directors don't seem to be that high. I mean, 
£46,000 for N.B. Fitzpatrick and £64,000 for A. Laker. They obviously wouldn't really have any bonuses given to them. That's more so because of performance. Shareholder value from peak has, over the past five years, given a return of minus 92%. So the total salary or remuneration expenditure totals around £110,000. Actually, we've seen here that there have been some options, and those options represent around 3.5% of the company's issued share capital. Each director holds around 14.5 million options. I don't see the details here, but it does say if I go down to note 16, which I shall do right now. Okay, so the lowest set of options are exercisable at 0.15 pence per share, 50 pence about sorry 50 percent not 50 pence above the current price if we look at the next set of options 0.21 pence per share they are double the current price if we look at the amount of options you got 10 million shares at 0.1 pence is, is that 0.1 pence per share yeah 0.1 pence per share at uh the exercisable price is 0.15 and 6.4 million at that 0.21. There are also some options that are probably not going to be exercised for a while. There's one set in 2014 that had been granted, and that was for 4 million shares exercisable at 0.33 pence per share, and one in April 2014 that was exercisable at 0.85 pence per share for 8.2 million shares. So it seems that uh, Vela's directors are being rewarded in the right way instead of just cash being chucked at them for no returns. The only issue is this encourages short-termism. If directors want to exchange their shares, then they can by just releasing some positive news flow for the short run that is at the expense of the long run. If we look at Scott Fletcher, he's a shareholder of the company. He holds around £200,000 of debt, 8% convertible loan notes issued by the company in 2016. It seems that these are holding the shares back because convertible loan notes, if anyone's familiar with them, they are basically obligations to exercise shares in the market at a discount, they use something called a volume weighted average price, otherwise known as a VWAP. And you just go and exchange your shares dependent on whatever's been going on with regards to the market price at the time. And then you just churn and churn and churn and churn. And before you know it, the share price has materially been diluted, which is worrying. It's a shame that uh, Vela hasn't been delivering for shareholders, but it is a tech company, so investors must tread with caution and only invest money that you are willing to lose, because companies that actually cannot generate revenue, pre-revenue companies, tech companies in particular, are very, very risky. You could wake up one morning and you could see an RNS saying that liquidation has occurred, and it is unfortunate. I've actually woken up once to this kind of thing, a very small holding, but I took the risk. It wasn't actually a liquidation, but it was more so. I woke up holding MTFB shares, Motive Bio, and they didn't secure the FDA approval, which I assume they had in the bag, to be fair. And the shares were down 50 odd percent, and I cut out a 50% loss. I mean, I could have done worse seeing the shares at the moment, but 50% at a small position that I was willing to take that kind of risk on. But we have to. Use the importance of position sizing, as mentioned in yesterday's podcast, and then structure our portfolio there. This kind of company is an example of those of which we shouldn't have too much exposure to. Okay, now moving on to Imperial Brands, PLC. They have just announced today that uh, they're going to release a pre-closed trading update, and that has actually come out around 20 odd minutes ago. And they have announced their group net revenue for the year to the 30th of September 2019 is expected to grow at around 2%. And that makes their earnings per share broadly flat at constant currencies. And the directors at 
Imperial brands have actually mentioned that whilst this is disappointing for the current year, we believe that NGP, which uh, accounts for their next generation products, so like vapes, etc., provide a significant opportunity to deliver additive growth to complement our tobacco business. And they've also mentioned that they continue to refine their investments behind building a strong and profitable next generation product business in a rapidly evolving market. They have mentioned that their AAA performance, otherwise known as Africa, Asia and Australasia, is down due to challenging market conditions. But if we look at their performance in Europe and the Americas, they've actually been growing. And that growth has actually offset the decline in the AAA markets, as we mentioned a couple of seconds ago. And we can also see that if we look at the financial performance, they expect the results will benefit around circa 30 million pounds of other gains this year compared with 80 million last year. The results are not as great as previous years, but we can note that due to foreign exchange volatility, good old Imperial Brands PLC can actually benefit their earnings by 2%. They've mentioned circa 2%, so it's at least 2% in this case. That is due to the pound dollar conversion rate. So that will hopefully make their results a little bit better. They've also mentioned their current cost optimization program has been making a good bit of progress that will realize annual savings of around 300 million pounds by September 2020. And yes, they're in a very, very difficult market, but they are trying their best to say the least. The next generation product market is expected to grow by around 50%. That is a very, very large number, but it is relative to the size. Their NGP business is relatively new. They want to grow net revenue by around 50% this year, but that is below their expectations, even there. So this is a little bit worrying, in my opinion. Imperial shares have actually taken quite a battering over the past 52 weeks. If we look back to 52 week highs, we'll put them at around £27.50 per share. 52 week lows take them to around £18.50. The close price as of yesterday, which was Wednesday the 25th of September, the 4.35pm GMT auction had closed Imperial Brown shares at £20.65 and pence per share. So the shares are up around 10% from lows, but they are down around 25.5% from highs. So the shares are down for the year, just to note, they began the year at £26.70 and now they are £20. So a drop of around 25-30% as I mentioned. That makes the company's shares trade at a price to earnings ratio of 14 and a half. And the market cap stands at just under 20 billion pounds. If we compare Imperial brands to let's say British American tobacco, let's just look at one figure of the price to earnings ratio. BATS, which is a similar company to uh, IMB, is trading at a PE of 11. I guess that makes IMB a little bit more expensive relative to one peer in their sector. We'd have to take a larger sample across multiple markets. But just from that look, it shows that IMB is a little bit overvalued relative to BATS, but it doesn't mean that the sector is expensive because historically the PE for stocks in the tobacco sector had been around 20, a P ratio of around 20. And currently we're seeing 10 to 15, which is a little bit worrying. 20 to 25, in fact, would have been a previous range. British American tobacco shares were trading at five and a half, sorry, 55 pounds 50 per share. Now they're at 29 pound 24. Uh, if we look back five years on Imperial brands, we can see that their shares were trading at highs of around 40 pounds per share and now 20. So they've almost taken a 50% haircut over the past couple of years. And those highs were made in around the period of August 2016. So it's unfortunate to see Imperial Brands reporting such 
an unfortunate update. There's no major problems, but they're just failing to deliver on growth expectations, low single digit revenue growth in their tobacco business and higher tobacco operating profit. I mean, that's fine, but they've even mentioned themselves that they have not performed by saying, whilst this is disappointing for the current year, we believe that one of our new products, the NGP area, provides a significant opportunity to deliver growth. So they've said, whilst this report wasn't that great, we will hope to produce something better. And we believe that we should do well in the future. We hope that for the sake of shareholders, Imperial Brands can deliver on these forecasts and commitments, hopefully, in the future. So now we're going to move on to the final company for the day, Independent Oil & Gas. They've released their half one 2019 interim results. And we can see that they highlighted their fundraise of aggregate proceeds of £18.9 million. And this was after they denied an offer from Rock Rose Energy. Rock Rose Energy wanted to buy out their debt for around £40 million. I believe, sorry, 52 and a half million pounds was the offer to buy the debt of the takeover target at the time, independent oil and gas. And that company, Rock Rose Energy, has actually submitted the debt offer after having a 26.6 million pounds acquisition proposal rejected by IOG's board at the start of March. As we can see, these results are for the period ending the 30th of June, so that will probably be involved here in the highlights. One important thing we should look at is that IOG actually had a successful raise of 100 million euros through a five-year bond, which sees the company fully funded for phase one of their project development that is hopefully going to be executed over the next couple of months. Now. Let's have a look at some other highlights. They have signed the definitive documents to farm out 50% of their portfolio, excluding Harvey, they've mentioned to Cal Energy Resources Limited. There's a lot of additional details, like a future news flow, including the completion of farm out to Cal Energy Resources Limited, an FID and commencement of the core project phase one execution, as we just mentioned a couple of seconds ago, and also their other well, the Harvey appraisal well results should be coming out. The full results will be coming out over the next couple of months. If we look at the financial side though, in terms of had the company made a profit, IOG lost 4.6 million pounds before tax for the first half of the year 2019. The total administrative expenses doubled, I assume with more work being made on their projects. They also quadrupled their project and exploration expenses from 288 odd million, sorry, thousand pounds, not million pounds, that would have been crazy, to 1.35 million pounds. That 1.35 million pounds figure increases their loss in comparison to the previous period. Their previous period loss, so first half 2018 loss before tax, was at 2.5 million pounds. And this year's first half loss stood at 4.6 million pounds. Finance expenses have also gone up, I assume with regards to loans, maybe small loans coming into maturity. So if we look at the balance sheet, we can see liabilities of 52 million pounds and total assets of 61 million pounds, giving them a net asset figure of around 10 million. That is obviously not a fair valuation if you look at what the company is doing with their asset. Independent oil and gas were offered to be bought out for around 26 million, as we said, by Rock Rose Energy for a company with such a large amount of debt. There is definitely some intrinsic value there. And the fact that they're fully funded shows that when IOG can start generating revenue, we start thinking back to companies the likes of Hurricane Energy, where yes, they were supposedly overvalued from a basic fundamental perspective, but they have a lot of future value that is still quite discounted at the value of something like 66 million pounds. At the moment, they had also mentioned that their cash balances stand at around 
14.5 million pounds. That is fine. And for me, that shows that they won't likely place. They did place recently, but they decided to decline the offer to get their debt bought out by Rockrose and potentially have to pay something through, say, CLNs or convertible loan notes. Instead, they decided to just place and get everything out of the way. And yes, it did harm shareholders in the short run, but for those who really wanted to get a little bit of value in the long run, this had secured the future for IOG, which was quite decent. And I think these guys are one to watch in terms of the story, to be honest. I don't hold shares, nor does anyone affiliated with Quantium Research. We don't hold shares on the long side or the short side, on independent oil and gas in particular, or in fact, any of the shares mentioned in today's podcast, including Imperial Brands and Vela Technologies. We don't hold any positions, warrants, etc. But uh, the market cap of IOG stands at uh, 66.5 million pounds. And if we look at the 52 week highs, they had been recorded at around 31.5 pence per share. The lows for the year have been recorded at around 10 pence per share. In fact, 52 week highs on the day had reached 35, but spiked back down. But as we mentioned, the lows had been recorded at 10 pence per share. So the shares are up 100% from lows and down around a third from highs. Some shareholder value if you got in on the low low. I mean, the shares went from 10 pence to 18 pence on the Rock Rose offer and crashed back down to 10 pence. And now they had been recorded as of close 25th of September, which was Wednesday, so yesterday. The last recorded trading price had closed at 19 and a half pence per share with a spread of 19.5 on bid and 19.7 on ask. IOG is definitely one to watch in the future because if somebody tries to offer to take over their debt and they've also been offered to be taken over by Rockrose Energy at around a market cap that is similar to the price now, a 50% premium to the shares when they were at around 12 pence per share, so around 18, 19 pence, giving them a debt plus cash valuation of something like 66. So that's about the current market cap. 18 or 19 on pence per share. So the shares are definitely valued here because they were about to be taken over, but uh, they declined it actually. I think it's reported here that Rockrose had uh, pulled out, but if we look at IOG's RNS, they mention that they had turned it down. So we don't know the exact result, but if one wants to clarify, it would be smarter to email the CEO of independent oil and gas, Andrew Hockey, or even the CFO, James Chance, or even some PR person. It's totally up to you. But anyways, that wraps up today's episode of the Quantium Cast. If you haven't already, make sure that you sign up on our site at quantumresearch.co.uk. I've been your host, Ryan Keir, and I've got another train to catch. Forgive me for the droning tone at some points in the podcast in these morning episodes i think tiredness is just starting to get the better of me but but all is well it is almost the weekend i hope all of you have a wonderful trading day ahead and we'll be back exactly this time tomorrow make sure if you haven't already check out our analysis on metro bank we looked at the share price of metro and also looked at the chart as to what are some potential setups on the long and the short side. So we gave a really unbiased approach as we do at Quantum Research. We always keep it raw and uncut, full flexibility. Anyways, though, I've been your host, Ryan Kia. Until next time.